Hi everybody, my name is Marissa and I have a bachelor's degree in mathematics with a minor in statistics. In today's lesson, I will describe the relationship between significance tests and confidence intervals. I will also explain how the confidence interval method can be used as a substitute for both the p-value and critical value method for determining statistical significance in a hypothesis test. Confidence intervals are a very versatile tool in statistics. They can be used to tell us how confident we are that the true value of a parameter is contained within an interval, as well as give us the results of hypothesis tests. For example, a confidence interval can tell us if a new high blood pressure medication is effective in lowering blood pressure, because if it is effective, every value contained within the interval will be less than the hypothesized value of the mean blood pressure before the medication. We already know that both the p-value method and the critical value method can be used to test for statistical significance, but we can also determine the outcome of a hypothesis test using confidence intervals. Using the confidence interval method for determining significance is important because having a range of values that our parameter can fall into provides more robust information than our other two methods. This method can also be faster because all we need to do is see if the hypothesized value falls within our confidence interval. Confidence intervals tell us how confident we are that the true value of a parameter is contained within a given interval. However, confidence intervals can also tell us the conclusion of a hypothesis test without needing to compute a test statistic, critical value, or p-value. Confidence intervals are typically used with two-tailed hypothesis tests because confidence intervals contain both an upper and a lower limit. Recall some of the formulas used for calculating confidence intervals. The formula we will need to use will be dependent on the parameter we are using for our hypothesis test. For example, if we are conducting a hypothesis test using the population proportion as our parameter, be sure to use the confidence interval formula for population proportion. Another value we need to consider when using confidence intervals in the context of hypothesis tests is our alpha level. The value of alpha tells us the likelihood of obtaining our results by chance. Confidence intervals go hand in hand with alpha. Alpha is always one minus the confidence level. For example, an alpha level of 0.01 would need to be used with a 99% confidence interval. If the hypothesized value of a parameter is contained within the interval, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. However, if it is not contained within the confidence interval, we reject the null hypothesis. In this example, the hypothesized value for the population mean, mu naught, is contained within the interval. Therefore, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. Although not as commonly used, confidence intervals for one-sided hypothesis tests can also determine statistical significance. In order to determine significance using confidence intervals for a one-tailed test, we only use the upper or lower limit depending on whether the test is left-tailed or right-tailed. We use the upper limit for a left-tailed test and the lower limit for a right-tailed test. We also do not split our alpha in half when constructing confidence intervals for one-sided hypothesis tests. In our example, we only have a lower bound because it is a right-tailed test. Because the hypothesized value for the population mean, mu naught, is contained within the interval, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Knowing if your test is left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed is important in constructing your confidence interval. Your alternative hypothesis will determine the tail of your test. One-tailed tests can either be left-tailed or right-tailed. We use left-tailed tests when we want to see if the value of the statistic is less than a hypothesized value, and right-tailed tests when we want to see if the value of a statistic is more than the hypothesized value. A less than sign will be present in the alternative hypothesis for left-tailed tests and vice versa for right-tailed tests. Two-tailed tests are used when we want to see if the value of a statistic is different than the hypothesized value. A does not equal sign will be present in the null hypothesis for two-tailed tests. In our blood pressure example, we would use a two-tailed test if we wanted to see whether or not 
blood pressure changed after taking a medication. A one-tilt test will be used if we wanted to see if pressure increased or decreased. Now that we have covered how confidence intervals and hypothesis tests are related, let's see what we've learned by doing a quick exercise. A recent study found that the average height for women in the United States is 5 feet 4 inches, or 64 inches. A random sample of 100 American women had an average height of 63 inches with a known standard deviation of 2 inches. Using the confidence interval method, can we determine if the average height for women in the United States is not 64 inches? Assume that alpha equals 0.05. The first step in tackling this problem is to determine what direction the alternative hypothesis is in, left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed. Because the phrase is not is contained in the problem, we can see that we will be using a two-tailed hypothesis test. We were also told that our alpha level is 0.05, so we know that we will be using a 95% confidence interval. Next, we need to decide what confidence interval formula to use. Because the problem states that sigma is known, we will be using the confidence interval formula for the population mean when sigma is known. Applying the confidence interval formula for the population mean when sigma is known, we obtain a confidence interval of 62.608 to 63.392. Because the hypothesized value of 64 is not contained within the interval, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the average height for women in the United States is not 64 inches. Despite the fact that the relationship between significance tests and confidence intervals is a fairly straightforward concept, there are a few mistakes that one should avoid. For starters, always ensure that the correct confidence interval formula is being used for the hypothesis test. In our example, we use the confidence interval formula for the mean when sigma is known. However, one may make the mistake of using the formula for the population mean when sigma is unknown because they missed the part of the problem that specifies that sigma is known. Additionally, the relationship between alpha and the confidence level must be equal. For example, use a 99% confidence interval when the alpha level is 0.1 in the hypothesis test. These mistakes can be avoided by reviewing the formulas used for creating confidence intervals. Knowing these formulas means that it will be easier to know when to use them in the context of hypothesis tests. It is also a good habit to always review the value of alpha before constructing the confidence interval to ensure the correct confidence level is used. Great job, everyone. Today we learned about the relationship between confidence intervals and significance tests. We also learned how to determine if a test is statistically significant using the confidence interval method and even applied it to an example. Thanks for watching and be sure to check out other videos about statistics lessons and applications here on TREG. Have a fantastic day and I'll see you next time.